one of the standards in there, um, one of the objectives in there mentions telehealth and telemedicine. And for so for that reason, um, that's why we selected this topic. But before we hand the microphone over to our presenter for the day, I just wanted to um, um, briefly mention that um, here under events, upcoming events, you will find um, the next webinars that'll be planned. And we, we're going to take um, next week off because we thought that we, we kind of guessed that that was um, maybe the week that some folks, school districts would be on spring break. So we won't have an um, event on April 7th. We still are finalizing the rest of April and we may go a couple of weeks in May. We don't want to go too deep in May just because we know that um, end of school gets very busy. Here under events also is the area where we archive all of the webinars. So um, here you can go back and pick up any of the webinars that we've done over the last, actually about the last two years. So, so there you go, there's that information. And I'm gonna stop sharing now. And the only other thing that I need to tell you is that if you're interested in a certificate of participation that documents your professional development, then you can, um, email Shay, she's our administrative assistant and her email was in the um, reminder message that you got earlier today, but I'm gonna put it here in the chat for you as well. So there you go. There's the, if you need a certificate of participation. So with that, I'll tell you a little bit about Elizabeth, what I know, say it again for me, your last name? Krupinski. Krupinski, okay. So I actually had an opportunity to hear her through another professional development opportunity. It was when you were presenting for Health Professions Network. Um, that was, I believe in October. And so it was just so interesting. Actually, I was going down the road, my husband was driving and I still was so engaged in what you had to say. So I want you to know how, how um, you made an impression with me. And so from there, we had her um, as a guest speaker at our annual meeting, which the consortium holds in January. And then someone, that attended that meeting said to me, I think this is a webinar that this, the teachers would appreciate as well. So with that, Elizabeth has lots to share and lots to tell you about the future of telehealth and telemedicine. So thank you, Elizabeth. We appreciate you being here with us. Great, thank you. And I, I love talking with audiences like uh, you guys because Teaching, mentoring, et cetera, is, is one of my passions. Um, my mother was a, a, a Latin teacher, then special ed teacher. Um, I taught for 23 years at the University of Arizona, undergrad stats, and I love mentoring events with, with kids and stuff. So, you know, getting the word out about telehealth is just like prime opportunity for me. So I, I thank you very much for um, having me here. Um, so, you know, the topic is helping make telemedicine work through the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers. But first, I wanted to start out with a little description of, you know, what is telemedicine in general? Uh, what are we talking about? And, you know, during COVID, more and more people have been exposed to telemedicine, and uh, a lot has changed with respect to telemedicine and uh, how it's being done and so on. But basically, it's using electronic information and telecommunication technologies to provide healthcare to people. Um, it's, it helps in terms of healthcare, patient and professional health-related education. Uh, so for example, uh, nutritionists can do diabetes education, helps with public health and health administration using all sorts of technologies like video conferencing, the internet, something that we call store and forward imaging, media, terrestrial, wireless communications, whatever it takes to reach out to people. Uh, telehealth, you may have heard that term as well. It's a broader term that encompasses healthcare services overall. Telemedicine specifically is typically about clinical services. Telehealth can go into non-clinical services that are associated with, with healthcare provision, such as training providers, administrative meetings, continuing medical education, in addition to those clinical services. So it, it does get to be much uh, broader um, than you would think. Uh, and these are just some examples. So 
a lot of it is is obviously visually based. Um, and what we're trying to do is to some extent replicate what happens in the clinic during an in-person visit, but also acknowledging that there a, are some limitations to interacting with people via a technology mediated encounter, but also there's some huge advantages to the technology that's used. Um, you know, one of the most common problems is, you know, parents who have kids with earaches and, you know, you can miss an entire day of school. Uh, the parents have to miss work because the kid was up all night, has an earache, and you've just got to get that kid to the urgent care clinic or whatever. There are now tools um, like up here in the upper left where you can literally, there's an app that you can use from your phone to get an image of the kid's eardrum, which is what the provider's going to want where they can actually snap that picture, show it to their provider, and potentially get a diagnosis as to what's going on without having to leave your home. And then everybody can go to work, go to school, because you've got a diagnosis fairly quickly. Uh, same thing, images, radiology, pathology, ophthalmology, uh, the center, the image in the center, being able to get pictures of the back of the retina to diagnose diabetic retinopathy. Again, there's actually apps on your phone that will help with this. Uh, and telemedicine is a lot looking at images. Dermatology, the one on the upper right, being able to simply show your provider what's going on using simple webcams. Uh, or like I said, taking a picture and, and sending it in what we call store and forward mode. So a lot of telemedicine is providing visual information to providers in the form of pictures to in a sense compensate to some extent for not being able to be there in person. There's also a lot more that you can do. Um, a lot of it is actually uh, based on auditory. If you think when you go into a visit, uh, being able to listen to your heart sounds. Uh, you may or may not have a stethoscope at home, most people don't, but there are, for example, uh, going to your, your primary care physician and maybe they get something, you know, when they put the stethoscope on you and maybe they think they hear something, but they're not a cardiologist, so they're not an expert. Yet, what they also don't want is you to have to wait two weeks to get an appointment with a new cardiologist, extend the time. Perhaps they could log on to a site where there's an expert cardiologist expert cardiologist logs into the provider with you there in the provider's office, get the electronic stethoscope out, and right then and there had that cardiologist listen to your heart sounds remotely or your lung sounds and be able to help the primary care provider with the diagnosis and to get you treated earlier. Speech therapy, rehabilitation therapy. Um, you know, there's a lot of kids who need uh, speech therapy. And so hooking up with a speech language pathologist uh, can readily be done using telemedicine. You can see the little girl there, uh, you know, doing her exercises with her pathologist at a distance. Doesn't have to leave school, could do it from home, all sorts of ways to do it remotely without having to go visit that, that speech language pathologist in their office. Uh, music therapy uh, for, for psychology visits and uh, just all sorts of things you can do remotely um, that you can do in person, but you can do just as well uh, remotely. Um, there's even more uh, sophisticated ways and, and things that are out there. There's something called tele-ICU, the picture in the upper right-hand corner, where there's a ton of patients who were in the hospital. Um, and especially now during COVID, you wanna limit even contact with patients in the hospital with their providers, with the nurses and so on. And so utilizing remote ICU services literally having detectors on the patients or sensors on the patients, cameras in the room, you can have people remotely watching and monitoring patients in the hospital in the ICU unit to reduce interaction, but to catch uh, signs of you know, something exacerbating and when a person really does have to go in there in person. Um, tell a stroke, the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, in a rural area, you may not have a neurologist or a neuroradiologist there to interpret the images or to assess the patient. So the general practitioners in a rural clinic can remotely hook up to a neurologist at a specialty stroke clinic and help you diagnose the patient there and say, you know, whether what kind of stroke it is perhaps, whether that person has to be 
transported to a uh, an academic medical center, for example, or a stroke center, or can they stay in their local community and simply be treated by the neurologist telling the, the provider what to do? Um, you may not think of it, but telesurgery, uh, down bottom left, there are actually ways to do surgery remotely, uh, surprisingly. Uh, whether it's by an expert surgeon mentoring someone at a rural site or actually controlling uh, the robot at the uh, re remote site to actually do the surgeries. And then simple things like uh, telepsychiatry, the one uh, on the upper, upper center there, just talking with the patient. And that's what most telemedicine visits are using simple technologies like what we're using today. You can do a lot with groups. Uh, you know, in rural communities, there aren't a lot of patients with the same type of disease. Uh, you could be a woman with breast cancer and you're in a small rural community and you're the only one in that community who has breast cancer and is going through that experience. Well, how do you do group therapy with, your, with one person? You don't, but what you can do as a, as a group therapy counselor is bring together people remotely into a virtual situation and have people at different sites possibly one or more, and do group therapy. Um, you can do a lot of educational training, diabetes education, and so on. All of this can be done via telemedicine with these, with these really great technologies. So huge, huge opportunities. Telemedicine can also reach into the patient's home uh, directly. Um, and there's a lot, for example, uh, over here on the right, we've got a patient who had uh, an ostomy. Uh, basically, he had uh, part of his colon removed and had to have some a, feet, uh, a, a waste tube put in. And when you go home with some of these tubes and things that you've never had before, one of the greatest risks is, is being infected or not taking care of them properly, not cleaning properly. Now, you can have a home health nurse go visit the patient on a regular basis, but that takes time out of their schedule patient schedule, and so on. You can do an awful lot remotely, again, with simple webcams and showing, especially with the help of maybe a spouse or a caregiver, what the patient's going through. And you can solve an awful lot of problems remotely. You can do uh, tele-rehab, bottom left there, uh, remotely as well. Um, a lot of kids with physical disabilities who need physical therapy. You no longer have to always go into a, a site specifically for that therapy. Uh, you, your family, uh, caregivers can, can help the kids uh, do their therapy remotely. So a ton of opportunities and ways that, that telemedicine is, is really helping people. Sort of the more futuristic side, but it really is here now, is wearable and usable devices. Uh, like I said, there's a ton of apps out there that can help with healthcare. Um, both that can be prescribed to you or that people can just download and use on their own a, a ton of information. There's smart watches, there's uh, heart rate sensors, respiratory sensors, there's sensors that we embed in people. Um, there's glucose monitoring. Uh, a lot of kids with type one diabetes, um, you, you've got to be aware of them in the classroom. Uh, you've got to monitor them, you know, be, be aware of what you do when a situation exacerbates when, when their sugar levels change. There's actually um, remote glucose monitors now. They, they put them right on their skin. They're there for a number of days. They upload, the, the little device uploads information into their phones. That phone can then connect back to a school nurse, a provider, et cetera, to monitor what's happening with their glucose levels and anticipate when uh, you know, things are gonna spike perhaps uh, and alert the teacher, hey, you know, something's going on with this student, uh, you, you, know, you know, might wanna intervene here. Mood trackers, apps that track people's moods, emotions, and so on. Um, you know, people tend to think that uh, you know, psychiatric care and, and psychological care is really only needed for adults. Kids, especially during COVID, are having so many issues. Um, uh, with mental and behavioral health. And there's a lot of apps out there where you can record. What's your mood? How are you feeling? And simply keeping track of things has been shown to really help, especially kids monitor what's going on. Uh, and when these uh, data are uploaded to a provider or even to a parent, um, interventions can be done and really help kids uh, with stress, with depression, uh, and basically getting along in the world. So a lot of very cool things going on. 
Uh, a survey during uh, COVID asked patients, what would they seek treatment for? And it really is uh, very broad. Um, and the three most common ones are, well, you know, allergies, ears, nose, and throat. And like I said, there are apps, uh, your, your, your cell phone can really get some really great pictures of your ears, of your throat. Uh, but simply getting on a visit with your provider with a simple webcam, even on a laptop, laptop or simply using your phone and positioning it properly, you can do an awful lot with a provider remotely to address uh, you know, ears, nose, and throat problems. Routine preventive visits, uh, people are willing to go and do that and, uh, via telemedicine. And what's very, very encouraging from my perspective is people are more than willing to do mental behavioral health counseling therapy remotely as well. And I would have to say that that is the number one use of telemedicine and has been for a number of years because it is so easy to do remotely and you can reach out and access, you know, patients who would never um, have uh, had access to, to behavioral mental health services or would have been less willing to do it in person if they had to travel or if their friends were to see them walking into a doctor's office. Uh, that's very stigmatizing, especially in kids and in certain populations as well. <clears throat> so being able to do this type of therapy remotely is just wonderful. All those other ones down there, um, you can kind of see de declining with, uh, you know, kind of how serious they are. You know, clearly down there at the bottom, we don't want people with heart related conditions or having a heart attack to call their telemedicine provider. We want them to call 911. And it doesn't surprise me at all. Not many people want to do their dental visits remotely. Um, you know, it, it, it's just kind of hard to do, but people are willing to do an awful lot remotely and nearly every clinical specialty that you can imagine is doing telemedicine now, especially since COVID to some degree. What do patients want and uh, uh, what will make it easier for them to make a telemedicine visits? Um, they want easy to use technology. It, it's got to be as easy as logging on to a Zoom, one click, boom, here I am. Uh, or maybe with a little bit of training uh, from uh, a schedule or a nurse or somebody right before the visit. Um, but most people these days of almost every demographic you can think of is pretty familiar now with uh, being able to log on and use technologies. Um, people don't know that telemedicine is available. And surprisingly, that's a, a marketing issue on, on the part of healthcare providers, hospitals, and so on. People would do it if they knew it existed, in a nutshell. People also want it quick and easy. Um, they don't want to have to call schedulers and wait online listening to the lousy music. People want to be able to go online, find a date and a time that's convenient for them, click make the appointment, get the link sent to them, and then log on. Uh, but they also want it now. <laughs> they want that appointment to be available now. Um, and that's especially with the, the generations coming up, but it, but it is very common elsewise. Um, surprisingly, some of the things that are of less of interest, understanding whether the insurance is going to cover it. Um, I would have thought that would have been a lot more of interest to people, but not so much. Uh, people aren't that concerned about having a secure platform. Um, you know, it's nice to consider security and privacy, but surprisingly, People would just, just get me the health care and, and get it to me now. Um, I don't really mind if it's not super, super secure. And, and I don't know if this is a reflection of the, the, the times or if people just don't really care in general, but the credentials and expertise of the physician or provider, only about 30% of people care about that. And, uh, you know, you think about when you go into a doctor's office, how many of us really check out their credentials in person Maybe it's not as surprising that we don't really care about it uh, when it's virtual as well. We just kind of assume that if you're offering services, you're going to be there. Well, now, where can you go for learning more about telehealth, telemedicine, uh, especially in your local region? Um, I am part of something called the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers. Uh, there are 14 of us. We are funded by the U.S. Health Resources and Service Administration, or HRSA. For the, through the Office for the Advancement of Telehealth. And we've all been around for about 12 years now. Uh, and we get uh, regular funding from uh, the federal government, from HRSA, to provide assistance with telehealth and telemedicine uh, training, 
advice to people who want to get into programs, how do you start it, and so on. There are 12 regional ones. And as you can see by the colors, we all co cover different areas of the country. I'm part of the Southwest Telehealth Resource Center down there in Brown, I guess, because we're mostly desert. Um, but every single region in the United States is covered. Uh, as well as uh, a lot of the Pacific Islands. And this year they're adding on uh, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands uh, to be covered by one of our, our regions as well. There's also two national level ones. Uh, one is uh, TTAC or the Telehealth Technology Organization. If you wanna know anything and everything about the type of technologies that are used in telemedicine, what your options are, how they perform, they have all the answers. And then there's the Center for Connected Health Policy, which knows everything about what you can imagine about telehealth policy regulation and so on. And the, all of us uh, are very familiar with all of these uh, aspects of telemedicine. And basically, like I said, we're, we're here to, to help you. Um, this is just a list of uh, the actual website links. Uh, as well as the uh, people who are the directors of the various uh, TRCs or telehealth resource centers. And uh, we're all in different types of organizations. Some of us are in academics, some of us are nonprofits, some are MDs, some are PhDs, MBAs, lawyers, it just varies. Uh, so coming from a wide variety of backgrounds uh, and areas of expertise, but we're all passionate about telemedicine and the provision of healthcare remotely. Uh, what do we provide? Um, we help, you know, organizations, networks, physicians, healthcare providers. Uh, we're also increasingly helping patients find providers and understand more and more about telemedicine. So we can assist with explaining what the equipment is, uh, helping you with your equipment purchases, policy, guidelines, business models, uh, training people and how to do telemedicine, assessing the market you know, is there a market for telemedicine in your area? We also have a lot of tools, templates, uh, starting guides, uh, just about anything and everything you can imagine we have in terms of resources. And I really encourage you, if you wanna incorporate telemedicine or aspects of telemedicine into your uh, coursework or uh, interactions with your students, please reach out to the TRCs because we can help you with some of our materials that you can provide uh, to your students, or we would love to just lecture to your students and, you know, give a half hour, hour lecture about what telemedicine is all about. We provide a, webinars on a monthly basis, sometimes more often. These are actually open to the public on all sorts of topics. Um, these are just some of our, our recent ones, uh, you know, telehealth, how to do it right. Uh, distance counseling, uh, all about uh, uh, telecounseling, uh, psychiatry, psychology, and so on. Uh, CMS updates. Uh, CMS is that that's Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, and during COVID, there's been massive, massive changes. And uh, we've been trying to keep up regularly with all of those and uh, uh, have uh, uh, people get informed about what's going on so they can basically get reimbursed and, and help patients better. How do we interact with people? You know, it, it varies. A lot of people just email us. Um, we have specific websites uh, where you can submit a request form to get in touch with us. It's all very easy. Uh, we answer a lot of questions that people have by simply by email or, or a phone call, but we also have video interactions uh, with them. We do a lot of on-site in-person training events and so on. So we really interact with folks in a whole variety of different ways which is kind of neat. Uh, we are experts, like I said, and uh, we are trying to be as rapid as possible in our responses. Most of our requests for, for assistance, technical assistance or TA, we answer within 24 to 72 hours, uh, unless it's a rather complicated topic or if it's a weekend or holidays, we're not, you know, a lot of times we won't get back to you until the next Monday. Um, we use a, a system called Basecamp, which allows us, even though we're 14 separate organizations, it allows us to communicate in real time and quickly get responses from people uh, in, in terms of questions that we might have that maybe we don't have the answer to because it's quite maybe out of our expertise or maybe uh, pertaining to another state. We meet regularly, so we all know what we're each other doing and, and trying to find as many ways that we can brainstorm about ways to help people understand 
what is telemedicine and how to get involved in it. We also meet annually with our, our federal sponsor, HRSA, as well as with other grantees. And we have strong ties with a lot of other organizations, our offices for rural health, our public health offices, VAs in every state, because like I said, uh, very important populations. Uh, and we have a lot of uh, contact with uh, critical access hospitals, uh, rural hospitals, uh, federally qualified health centers, and so on. We have broad and deep, deep, deep knowledge about the telehealth industry, the technology, the trends, and everything else. And we try to be as much as possible, you know, a neutral third party to explain to people what is telehealth, what's the technology, but we never endorse a particular company's platform or technology. We simply provide people with the information they need to go out and make decisions on their own about what would be useful. I talked about rapid response capability. During COVID, we all experienced a huge, huge rise in questions coming in about telemedicine, people asking for training, exposure to an explanation of what is telemedicine. And as you can see from this graph, kind of prior to February of last year, you know, we were kind of uh, holding steady with a regular number of consults and then uh, things just exponentially rose uh, at the beginning of COVID. Uh, it kind of tailed off, but then every time there's a wave in COVID uh, increase in cases, we get a wave in the, you know, what people are expecting from us. So it's, it's really interesting to see, but we were absolutely prepared to help people educate uh, about what telemedicine can help in, in terms of uh, providing healthcare remotely. Um, we all set up uh, COVID resource pages, uh, and I encourage you again to go out to the uh, various sites, uh, especially the ones for your particular region, and look at their resource pages, because these are uh, materials that are available to you as um, educators to talk to your students about telemedicine and get them interested in it as potential careers. Um, so we set up a, a response page and provided links to tools, templates, resources, funding opportunities. Uh, there's actually an interesting one now from the FCC, the Federal Communications uh, Commission, which is actually directed at patients, who patients can now apply for funding to help them get laptops or access to broadband so they can do telemedicine from their homes. Really great opportunity. We've had Elizabeth, a ton of, yeah. Now might be a good time to um, address, you talked about um, getting students interested in um, careers that involve telehealth, telemedicine. Um, Peg had a question there. Um, yeah. So um, she was interested in hearing about it. You want to read that? If you sure. See. So the, the question is, I'm curious about available jobs as a result of the growing use of telehealth. Uh, I hear a position called a telehealth presenter. Not crazy about the title, but it sounds like a good opportunity for students to get into healthcare. Yeah, um, it, it actually is a good title um, because what, what the telehealth presenter does is, and it can be um, uh, someone, for, for example, like if you remember Candy Stripers, and I don't know if Candy Stripers still exist, um, but I remember I used to read books about Candy Stripers, and it wasn't Nancy Drew, but it was somebody else. But you know, student volunteers, especially high school students who are potentially trying to get into the healthcare field, they do these volunteer positions and a, health, a telehealth pre presenter could be just that kind of position. Um, basically, it's somebody who works uh, typically in a, a, a provider's office, uh, but it could potentially be done in the patient's home, depending on the circumstances, where they help the patient present their symptoms and so on to the providers. Um, so, for example, you may have a patient, an elderly patient, who um, fell down and hurt themselves, and so they need someone to help interact with the provider, and the provider may want them, for example, so suppose they hurt their shoulder, they may want them to do uh, what we call range of motion exercises, but how do you explain to someone, I want you to do, show me the range of motion of your arm, move it up like this, you, the telemedicine presenter has been taught how to help the patient go through these motions or how to help a patient get their blood pressure so they can show it to the provider. So it's a really great position actually. And it really is uh, something that's available uh, 
to students and student volunteers in, in, in certain circumstances. I'll talk a little bit about more about other career options uh, in, in a few minutes as well. Um, the topics that we deal with in our, in our training and on our resources, just all sorts of stuff. And you can see from the topics here, these are just the top 10, sort of the variety of areas that telemedicine relies on. And thus again, getting into the training aspect, the whole scope of who's involved in telemedicine. There's legal and regulatory people. There's people who understand billing and coding, uh, technology people. It's not just the doctors, it's everybody within the healthcare enterprise that can help patients uh, through, through telemedicine. So there, there's just an awful lot that can be done. Um, the TR studies, uh, again, we have a huge impact. Um, we do this through technical assistance and we help all sorts of people. Uh, on average, about 16 years of contact uh, per organization. So uh, we do have longer consultations, but for, like I said, over a decade, we've been providing this type of assistance, doing outreach webinars, talks like this, um, regional conferences where we go and educate uh, various people about telemedicine and how to do it. Overall, a lot of our technical assistance is free. So again, if you are interested in, in getting us to perhaps help you educate your students, please do reach out. We have materials. We can actually come and do webinars into your classes. Uh, we, we love just uh, talking to everybody. Uh, if you're actually interested in setting up a telehealth program, probably not, um, but we, we, we do that for free as well, up to about 10 hours. We, like I said, we are the experts in the area. We, we love to collaborate and we have timely resources. And our motto is we are here for you. And we really do kind of adhere to it. Now, what are some of the opportunities for health science educators in terms of, you know, telling their students about telemedicine? Well, I, I am a firm believer in pipelines and, and trying to get those pipelines back as far as possible. Uh, to help people get interested in careers as early as possible and show them the opportunities that are out there. Um, and like I said, there's a ton of different areas involved in telemedicine where you can have uh, an area of expertise where you never thought it could apply to healthcare, for example, like IT or administration, or even somebody who wants to be an inventor um, or artificial intelligence and informatics. These are huge, huge areas within telemedicine. And if you look at sort of the diagram there on the left, this is just a typical um, uh, org chart. We're talking about, you know, what, what does the telemedicine provide? There's typically a board with some administrative services. But then if you look at all the different services there, information services, therapeutic, diagnostic support, and then under there, all the job listings, all of these are relevant for telemedicine and have huge opportunities for, for students to get involved in the healthcare industry in ways that are, are far beyond just becoming a doctor or a nurse. Um, and if you look at a healthcare system, the, the figure on the right, there's just so many intersections between healthcare and so many other areas that people never think about, business, um, uh, telecommunications, the tech industry, uh, e-health literacy, I mean, informing patients to become better aware of what uh, uh, health literacy is all about and becoming people informed decision makers about their own health. Um, pharmacy, government, policy, there, there's so many careers available within healthcare that touch upon healthcare and thus on telemedicine as well. I think that developing training programs uh, at, at further and further levels down the pipeline uh, really can push the envelope for educating our future trainees even earlier to enter healthcare professions and promote what I think is critically important, the culture of interprofessional collaboration. Too often we educate people uh, in silos. Our medical students don't talk to our nursing students. They don't talk uh, to our public health students who don't talk to our rehab students and everybody's being educated in these silos but then you've got patients whose lives intersect with all these different professions and yet our professions don't talk about or understand each other yet if we start people earlier in this pipeline towards education and training in healthcare, maybe we can uh, 
break down some of these silos and get people to communicate with each other. Um, this just shows the growth in medicine overall and in telemedicine as well since the mid 1850s through the 2000s about the number and types of careers available in uh, healthcare and telemedicine. Uh, it used to be, you know, if you go back, it was just providers, uh, physicians, really. You had to be an MD. And then you started to get uh, nurses into the field and then pharmacists and registered nurses, uh, licensed practitioners, aides, therapists, technicians, managers, and so on. All of these people are involved in healthcare and, and you can just see the little bars going up and the number of people and opportunities for non-physicians and other providers to be involved in healthcare is just immense these days. And I think we can work even farther back than we do. Uh, these are high school students that we've trained um, and we've even gone out and, and trained uh, seventh and eighth graders on how to, you know, how to dissect things, how to go into a pathology lab, how to understand what cancer is all about and never, never underestimate kids' enthusiasm as well as their ability to comprehend complex information. Uh, we started teaching kids, you know, down in the, the lower left there. I mean, that, that kid is in his early seventh grade. Doesn't look it, but he is. Um, we've gone back, uh, you know, like I said, almost into middle school, teaching kids complex ideas about pathology and the origins of cancer, just to get them interested in thinking about a healthcare career. And it's the same with telemedicine and the opportunities in, in technology, healthcare, and so on. So I have no qualms about teaching even grammar school kids about the opportunities in a healthcare career and helping them understand uh, the opportunities within telemedicine as well. So from my perspective, you know, telemedicine is here to stay. It greatly increased uh, during COVID, but people are gonna come back after COVID looking for telemedicine. The patients are gonna demand it. I mean, once people figured out that I don't have to drive an hour to sit in a waiting room for a half an hour, 45 minutes with a bunch of other sick people, to see my provider for maybe 15, 20 minutes, go back, find my car, drive back home. I've wasted an entire day. But with telemedicine, you can make an appointment, log on, stay with your provider for a half an hour, sometimes an hour. Telemedicine visits are very efficient. I can see it in school, in work. You can do everything remotely in, in a lot of things. Yeah, you still have to go in for your labs. You have to go in for your x-rays, complicated things. You know, There's still reasons why you've got to see your provider but so much can be done remotely and patients are just gonna demand it after COVID to still be doing some of this stuff remotely. Um, it really impacts patient care and the broader community as a whole. And every specialty uh, in healthcare is using telemedicine to some degree and will continue to do so. I am firmly convinced that we, we need to and we can start training our future workforce to truly fully realize the potential of telemedicine and we can integrate it seamlessly into our healthcare systems, into our homes and into our lives. If you think about what I, on my, like a fifth slide, the one about remote sensing technologies, you got students who are interested in artificial intelligence, in uh, robots and all of these cool things, but that's healthcare too. And kids have to realize that even if they wanna be a, a hardcore engineer or a physicist, all of that can still apply to medicine and telemedicine. So, you know, you can open up their eyes about opportunities outside of sort of the more traditional paths. And I honestly think that healthcare educators like you are, there, are the key to the future and training that future workforce in, the, in the, uh, the, the capabilities and the opportunities and the potential of telemedicine. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you want to contact me, there's my email. And again, uh, any of the telehealth resource centers is a, a great resource uh, and willing to talk to, to kids in your schools as well. Okay, don't leave us, Elizabeth. We still have I'm you. I'm not going oh, anywhere. We still have you on contract for 15 yes, minutes. Yes. <laughs> I can even Amazing. stay Amazing. We love all your research that you had done um, and how you really spoke to health science educators. I was just 
clapping. I don't know if you heard me, but I just really appreciate you making this so personal for them. Great we do great. have uh, Jamie on. Um, uh, Jamie, you want to unmute yourself and tell us a little bit about what you did before you became a, a teacher? I, hey, Laura. <laughs> I got on this because I saw telemedicine and I got so excited because I actually left my job to come and teach because, and Elizabeth, you can speak to this because um, it was a challenge to get buy-in from different levels. And I was a telemedicine a nurse consultant with Integris, mm. which is a local hospital here. And we did telestroke. I was also helping with other um, programs to try and get them up and running, but the pay, you know, they weren't paying for consults mm -hmm. and it just it there was a huge barrier with buy-in but now that telemedicine I mean now that COVID happened yeah. people the the community people are understanding the value of it and so I'm so excited I, I I mean this is sad COVID has been terrible obviously but it's also opened up so many doors so one of the things the challenges I faced because I worked for a big tertiary center and we would go out to these rural hospitals mm -hmm. and you know, we call them extenders because um, they would obviously do the, the video consults with our physicians and there was a knowledge gap in specialty. So you had these generalists in these rural communities who were trying to be specialists. And so there was a huge need too for education on pathophys and, and some other things that we were trying to do. And, and also they didn't have very many positions like I had. And so mm -hmm. it was kind of like, let's make this up and see what we can find. And so yep. it, I, I'm excited. This is exciting. But this is a discussion. I'm, I'm look forward to the future with this. So, right. Yeah. And, and that was so, so common, your experience, trust me. Mm -hmm. um, and now, you know, in terms of buy-in, people sort of had no choice. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the future. I, I like I said, I'm convinced it's going to be a hybrid. Um, I don't think people can go back to the way it was 100% brick and mortar. Um, during COVID, the federal government, CMS, put a lot of waivers in place. Uh, for example, things like being able to, to provide across state borders. Um, all More CPT codes, uh, 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 reimbursement codes were opened up and so on. Even telephone visits. Uh, be, became allowable. Now, some things are going to go away. A lot of the, tele, the telephone, I think some of that's going to go away. Um, HIPAA regulations, privacy and security. Um, we were able to do a lot of encounters using non-HIPAA compliant uh, platforms like, like FaceTime and, and just straight Zoom. Uh, that's all going to go back. Um, you know, but, but a lot of it is going to stay in place and, and people just really, they, the cat was out of the bag. And you're right, it, it, it took a, a public health emergency, um, but boy, did it really have an impact on people's awareness of, you know, I, 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 dri I, I was driving, oh, I don't know, we took a, you know, you, you can't travel, but we, we took a road trip uh, last fall. And I just remember going through rural Appalachia and, and seeing road signs, we do telemedicine. And it's like, oh my God, you know, call us, it's virtual care. It's like, wow, okay, I'm out in the middle of nowhere. And there's this billboard on the side. I, I had to stop and, and I told my husband, pull back. We're taking a picture of that. And I tweeted it out. It's like, this is just awesome. And, and it, you know, it took an emergency, but we're, we're getting closer. I was um, walking um, my little afternoon walks and right in front of the Walmart near my home was this big telehealth sign out in front. You know, I took a picture of it and put it out too, because like <laughs> you say, it's just everywhere, you know, yeah. it's, it's great. I wanted to make sure that, um, Jamie, the question was kind of directed at you from Peg about what was a telehealth extender. And um, Peg, did, did Jamie capture what you um, were asking? Or would you like for her to elaborate a little more? Yeah, Jamie, I think I'd like you to elaborate a little bit more about that position because I really am just kind of like curious about potential future positions that might be something that our students could pursue in the future. Well, I think it goes back to, I mean, again, the, we called it extender. I think it's the same thing as presenter, Elizabeth. You okay. can speak back to because really it's someone you have, it depends on the modality you're using because you may have somebody who is at their home who's going to be that person that's going to help that person set the again you go back to what you presented on the user ability 
is the most important. Like if I have my 95 year old grandmother who needs to see her doctor and she doesn't know, how she, she's got macular degeneration, how's she gonna set that, that encounter up? And so you need an extender or a presenter, somebody like a CNA student. I've got, I actually have some of my students are working with where my grandmother lives. And so having them be able to set her up for an encounter with her physician is what we need. So what does that look like? Should we integrate that into a classroom? I haven't even thought about this, Laura. I'm so excited. You don't know how excited I am right now. But, you know, and then I, we did a, a, an encounter with our students and kind of explained to them what telestroke was because you have a physician at the tertiary center, these acute hospitals who are talking to a, a hospital, you know, 40 miles away that don't have neurologists and they're doing a telestroke encounter. Well, the nurse is the one who's doing the NIH stroke scale with the neurologist. I went out and trained those nurses in the rural hospitals how to do the NIH stroke scale and get NIH stroke scale certified where they hadn't been doing that prior. They were just transporting those patients out. So every single one of those um, individuals looks different. It could be a CNA, it could be a nurse, it could be the MA. So that again, I think, I, I, I agree. We, we even had the same thing, Elizabeth, we had the same problem, like, do we call them extenders? What do we call them? Um, the, and, under, and helping people understand what that looks like is difficult too, because again, it depends on the modalities and stuff. Right, so Jamie, I wasn't crazy about the title of telehealth presenter. And I, so I asked, is there any opportunity for that title to um, be morphed into something else? And I was told no, that that was pretty much the title. Mm. I almost in my head, and this could just be another aspect of that role, was um, seeing um, healthcare professionals, office staff, uh, present the patient to the physician. So they would be the one getting the patient ready um, mm -hmm. by way using technology to get them ready for the physician. Because so he's busy doing other things, checking labs, reading, you know, kind of getting up to date with the patient's uh, medical record. And this person is getting the patient ready for the physician to come into the meeting the appointment with them. So I guess there's lots of different roles there that probably will will understand better 10 years from now because it's still evolving, but it's just kind of a fascinating area if you ask. Well, me. and just the, the role, you know, like that Jane was talking about, about, you know, somebody being able to go into the patient's home or even help them remotely. You know, if you think of the kids these days, they know how to do all this. Oh, yeah. they're, they're just whiz kids. I mean, you know, you talk about links, da, 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 let me go to the end, and they just do it. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that they can help with, you know, simply be going in, you know, or, or apps, you know, a physician can, you know, suggest to a patient, you know, I'd love for you to use an app to record your blood pressure every day. And so, you know, you can go to CVS Walgreens, get, you know, you know I happen to have one here. It's a wrist one. <laughs> and I went downstairs, that, that's a regular cuff. And you can get your blood pressure but it associates with a phone app. It would take a, a, a high school student, a, a middle school student, two seconds to figure it all out. Ah, oh, you connect, do, 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 you push this. Explain that to the 98 year old grandmother, the 75 year old grandmother, you know, and, and kids, they're, they're, you know, they can be impatient, they can be patient. Some of them are amazing. And you get the right kid there, they could sit down with somebody and say, here, you know, I'm going to just walk you through it. We can go through it as many times as you want. And here we go. And this is how you push this button. And, you know, and they can really help people understand how to get through the steps that they need to be able to hook up with their provider. I mean, I think, I think there's just massive opportunities here. I wish too, that this would be more, talk about buy-in again. I feel like, I feel like facilities whether it's ambulatory centers or it's, you know, hospital systems, I feel like they need to be committed to opening up those positions too mm -hmm. and offer that resource instead of having, or, or we say super user, but, you know, somebody that specializes in this and can be the trainer, train the trainer kind of thing. I just feel like there needs to, again, be, because I met with my doctor through a video conference and I was cracking up thinking, 
I could tell that they were new to this. And I was like, man, I wish I could be on the other hand, helping them out because I know they're, they're, they were like, oh, by the way, you're going to start doing telemedicine visits if you want to keep seeing patients. And so if they had had those resources available to them to be able to start up like you guys have, that you, the resources you all have, it would be amazing. I just wish there was more buy-in too. I think it's increasing. I, I you know, I, I honestly think that within the next, you know, uh, Nancy, you said 10 years, I think within five years, you know, th these, th these so more positions are gonna be available, open, because like I said, I don't think we're going back. It's gonna be some kind of hybrid and we're gonna be needing to hire people who have the skills to make this happen. Don't you think it has something to do with um, reimbursement too? Yep. I mean, so oh, much absolutely. of it because absolutely. if you don't go in and see the doctor, they don't get your money. And sure. um, I can see even whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing, it's, it's the thing. <laughs> yeah. So. And, 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 you know, and I, I think that, you know, the funders really actually did a fairly good job of, of loosening things up, making things happen um, and, and allowing telemedicine to, to blossom. Like I said, and I don't think th some things are going to go away, but a lot of it's going to stay in place. One other, I'm sorry, just one other point. I see a lot of, um, crossover with community health workers too, okay. that this would be the perf, this would be a perfect um, skill for many of them to have because that there isn't necessary in, well, it depends on the state, but the mm -hmm. overarching, the, there is not a, a practice that they have. It's that I know a lot about public health and mm -hmm. I want to help people. It's not necessarily um, I'm a nurse, I'm a, I'm a doctor, I'm a medical assistant or whatever, no certifications necessarily attached, but, um, that was going through my mind was this would be the perfect thing, you know, cause they're already out in the community to be able to, to do those kinds of things. Well, and especially when you think about, and, you know, I've mentioned rural, but I mean, even in urban, I mean, we've got a lot of health disparities that exist. And there are a ton of different populations, Native American, Hispanic. I mean, you can just go down the line, those with disabilities, um, you know, those who have mental health problems. I mean, there's just so many people that don't have access to adequate health care um, that, yes, these community health workers, promotoras, um, you know, and a whole variety of folks that, that have the skills that don't necessarily have a degree that goes behind it, but they have the skills and they have the interest in helping their communities and you can get out there and, and, and with very simple tools, help these patients, even the homeless. I mean, there are, there are groups of students I know, you know, medical students, uh, college students who are helping homeless people simply by helping them get access to phones and laptops, you know, coming to a site and saying, okay, here, we're setting up a, a clinic and we're gonna do a remote clinic uh, with providers and, you know, homeless people are getting access to care when they couldn't previously. And I'm going to say something. This is Claris from Michigan, um, but I'm going to say something. Don't forget, and you're going to, don't laugh, Nancy and Laura, about service learning. This is a perfect opportunity for high school and middle school students to go in and and get their grandparents or whatever on the computers. So. Absolutely. We only laugh because um, we could hear you. So um, Clarice has a history of speaking softly. And so we could hear her so well right then. Good <laughs> job, Clarice. Okay, I was looking to see um, if there was a question in um, what Tanya had there. She's just talking about, um, she's just um, kind of affirming what we've all had to say and, and there in the chat. but. Elizabeth, you, you're amazing. Now everybody knows why I was just so thrilled that you agreed to do a webinar for us. And thank you. Just, um, I can't um, tell you enough um, how much we appreciate it, your time. We know that you put a lot of time in this because you really streamlined it and made it really applicable to health science educators. So we look forward to posting this on our, um, in our right. archived area of our website and um, we have so many other opportunities for your consortium because Great. we're going we're gonna to hope that our state leaders that we work with across the nation will reach out to them to have them come in and speak to their teacher groups or 
you know, have the teachers understand that you all are willing to even speak mm -hmm. down to the classroom level. So that is absolutely is amazing. So everybody, let's give her a round of applause. Thanks. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. And we look no. forward to um, other opportunities that we have to. Absolutely. Um, I, I would love to. I'd love to talk to you guys. Okay. Bye, Thank everybody. You. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.